when um, the president was considering invoking the Insurrection Act during the riots of 2020. Insurrection Act of 1807. The president basically has carte blanche to bring the military into the District of Columbia. His own uh, civilian secretary of state made it publicly clear that they opposed that order and would not implement it. Huh. Right. I do not support invoking the Insurrection Act. And that's the administrative state. It's the bureaucrats, the rule makers, the rule writers, the rule interpreters and enforcers inside these behemoth federal agencies that nominally report to an elected president, but who really have outsized power to do what they want and prevent things that they don't want from being done. Right. And their basic idea is the modern world has become too complex for constitutional government as envisioned by the founders in the 18th century to work. That maybe that constitutional framework, um, which is deliberately slow, cumbersome, lots of checks and balances, makes things hard to do and makes government slow moving and so on. Maybe that worked in three, you know, 200 years ago, but it doesn't work now. Life is too complicated. It's uh, society, the economy, everything is complex and we need, we need rule by experts with speed. You know, you need, you need expertise and knowledge, okay, and, and, and dispatch, which means all of these checks and balances and having to pass two houses and vetoes and supermajorities and this kinds of things for certain types of uh, legislation or, or actions. And that all slows everything down and doesn't, it doesn't make it work. Mm -hmm. So one way to address the inefficiency is to invest in expert class with power. And how do you do that without changing the written word of the Constitution, which they were careful not to change, in part because it's hard to do, in part because the more you can mask what you're trying to do, right, is say that this is, in, this is in keeping with the government. We're not fundamentally changing anything. The easier it is for people to accept it. So the way they did that is they I grafted on a fourth, essentially a fourth branch of government inside the second branch, inside the executive branch, and that's the administrative state. It's the bureaucrats, the rule makers, the rule writers, the rule interpreters and enforcers inside these behemoth federal agencies that nominally report to an elected president and to the cabinet secretaries he appoints and who get confirmed by the Senate, a political process, but who really have outsized power to do what they want and prevent things that they don't want from being done. Right. It's like the, the, the bloodless revolution that most people have never heard of, just kind of this advent of this brand new branch of yeah. government that has ins insane amounts of power. Yeah. How much do you blame it, though, for kind of aggressive annexation of power within the executive branch and administrative agencies versus just congressional passivity and dysfunction? Oh, equally. That they give up a bunch of power. Equally, definitely. Congress. They just refuse to, like, that. nut up and actually say what they mean and put down what they mean in the laws. Right. They don't, they don't write laws. They write, essentially, guidelines that are then made into law by the so-called the rulemaking process I described. Yeah. So Congress passes Dodd-Frank or the Affordable Care Act, just to name two momentous pieces yeah. of legislation from the last, let's say, 15 years. Uh, each law, by the way, is really long. I think, you know, they're a couple thousand pages each. And yet they still don't define what's to be done or not done. They're handed to an agency, sometimes multiple agencies, because there's so many cross-cutting areas of, of authority and responsibility, who then write rules, and those rules are the actual laws that people or corporations or entities have to obey. They're not written by an elected legislature in that sense, or legislators in that sense. They're written by people who don't have accountability. Now they claim, I actually saw this argument made in apparent sincerity, and it made me laugh. It says, uh, no, administrative rule is in fact the most democratic form of rule there is because there's a public comment process where once the bureaucrat writes the rules, there's a 30-day period where you can write what you want to say. And I thought, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. But yes, that person thought, oh, that makes it democratic. Now, does, does the comments, I guess sometimes they change the rules based on the comments. But once those powers are in the hands of um, administrative state agencies, they almost never come back. And one way Congress could make them come back would be to um, you know, start asserting its statutory and constitutional powers that it doesn't. Like it's, as you say, it cedes its legislative power. It holds but doesn't really use the power of the purse. So it could say, hey, Agency X, we didn't authorize you to do that and that's illegal or that's you know, inappropriate. Um, stop. And when the agency just doesn't return its phone call, Congress could say, oh, guess what? You're not getting your budget or some portion of your budget until you come to heel. They have that power and they don't use it. Right. But it's a kind of bipartisan institutional cowardice. Though. Yes. I mean, I think you write as much in your book that yeah. it's 
I mean, there's a lot of Republicans that seem like they just want to be social media stars and don't want to actually do the dirty work. And they, you know, well, and also they don't they don't sufficiently use their oversight powers, which they could use to greater, you know. I mean, I, look, it's politics, right? So you congressional hearings that get you on TV are good. Congressional hearings that are grinding and boring, but that actually sort out uh, wrongdoing or or bad behavior in the government, you know, that's hard. Why why do that? But that's a power that they could use. I, I'm I'm hoping. I, I've been saying this a lot lately. You know, it looks like the Republicans are going to win a pretty big victory in 2022. Take back the House with some big numbers. The generic balloting is is better for Republicans than it almost than it ever is right right now. Um, that's early. Who knows what may happen in several months? But it's looking pretty good. Well, when they get there, if they get there, I'm hoping that they don't just say, "Okay, we're here. Now we've got the nice offices again. We've got the perks and stuff. Let, you know, let's not do anything." That, that rocks the boat, you know, no risky votes that might cause us to lose a margin of our, our membership in the 2024 election. No, they need to get in there and use those powers if they get them back. Okay. Is there any way, though, in which the last two-ish years of COVID have at least slightly dampened your fear of the administrative state. And I only mean it this way, and you get into this in your book as well, yeah. which is COVID revealed profound institutional catastrophic incompetence in a lot of administrative agencies. And once they finally got on the ball, as witnessed by like, you know, the CDC director being double masked and triple vaxxed in January, 2022, when delivering some testimony at a congressional uh, subcommittee, also like, institutionally neurotic and like weird depressive shut-ins. Like, th- I mean, there's, I mean, this, I, I, I used to live out in Fairfax. We were just, we just swung by the cul-de-sac I used to live in where I was surrounded by the dutiful drones of the deep state. And again, they have too much power. They're wildly overcompensated. Like I'm very proud of them for their masters in public policy from GW or whatever, but they, you don't do anything other than conduct Zoom meetings. But at the same time, when you meet them and then you saw the way that they acted during a once in a generation crisis, part of you's like, a lot of these people are just like thoroughly mediocre and incompetent, and you know, so it's like okay, but the, the you know, and so we live out. I live out in Ford F one fifty land, so it's like you can try, homie, you can try, but I'm just not particularly afraid. It, it, yeah, all right, all right. If you're if if you're giving the white pill, allow me to give the, the let's call it gray, not not quite black. But the flip side to that yeah. is, I was discouraged at the speed with which communities all across the country just immediately complied with lockdown and. And, and, and mask mandates and things that were not legislatively passed in any way, whether by a state legislature, the federal government, or a county. Um, and go- bureaucrats just said, in some t- cases governors, in some cases just bureaucrats said, do this. People did it and snapped and, and, fu- and obeyed orders. You know, every time you get on a plane now, they say, ladies and gentlemen, it's a federal, by, according to federal law, you have to wear a mask. No. Okay, the FAA may have said so. That's not a federal law unless it passes that building over there yeah. in a floor vote, yeah, yeah, both yeah. houses, and goes to the president's desk and gets signed. The, trust the science is hardly any different than um, uh, the rule of experts, Woodrow Wilson's rule of experts, or the men of schools, as he said. And uh, uh, that, that rapidity, you know, we, we can, we're just going to impose this right now, is a direct descendant of the progressive saying the old constitutional processes are too slow and cumbersome to deal with the complexity and and speed of the modern world. Right. At the same time, Trump was president in 2020. Do you think he could have done more to combat some of this administrative overreach related to COVID? I mean, I give him credit where credit's due. I mean, I wish he had done a little bit less of the, you know, uh, some alternative treatments that have not proven out. But in terms of fighting back against excessive lockdowns and COVID measures, I do think that he deserves some credit, but he probably could have done more. I think it it, it was reasonable in the first months. I I don't want to put a date on it because I don't know when, but, uh, you know, to wonder, is this going to be as bad as people are expecting it? Maybe we do need to take these additional precautions. Um, there came a point, and that point definitely came in 2020. I don't know exactly when. Oh yeah, when come on, yeah, yeah. It was clear, at least to, to, to many of us, that no, we don't need to keep doing this. We did it uh, out of an abundance of caution at the beginning. This, these, these measures are not appreciably helping, and they're definitely damaging to our liberties, and they're setting a terrible precedent. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that. But it's also, it's a very good example of what you call the regime in action, which is the government has certain policies and then there's a massive multi-billion dollar propaganda arm that advances particular yeah. narratives to, like came up today in the interview we did earlier today. Just 
it's, we're almost two years deep into the pandemic. If you walked around and just surveyed people, what is the infection fatality rate of COVID-19? This, this disease that has taken over your life for two years, this basic well-established fact out of every thousand people that get it, how many die? How many people could answer that question even remotely correctly? Probably one out of every 10,000. Okay. And, and all of them work in this, all of them work in this office, right? Like how many, of the, how many people actually know the answer? How many people know the answer about the age gradient, you know, and how, and it's like, but I thought this is something that has been covered 24 hours a day and still people don't have very basic facts and figures about it. That's well, the I regime they, in action. Uh, yeah, because they, they get, they're getting continually misled. Well, right. The other thing was when, when COVID started, it wasn't a partisan issue and it wasn't clear how it was going to shake out as a partisan issue. And in fact, yeah. to the, in the early um, development of it as a partisan issue was the reverse of what we have now. It was Democrats and the left saying, don't worry about this. You know, remember, remember with, uh, Nancy Pelosi, go to China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go eat out in China. Xenophobia, if you because don't, if you, you gotta go if eat some If you think this thing is a problem, then you're racist. <laughs> um, or uh, and, and it, was, it was the reverse. <laughs> and it obviously, over the course of that year, shook out differently um, because of the, I guess, the, the way the propaganda evolved. Um, but that abundance of caution, I think, I said, I said, just to repeat, was reasonable in the beginning. For six, was it six reasonable for six weeks, eight weeks? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Reasonable in the beginning, but you know, it quickly became that this is not. I mean, it's a pandemic, but it's not this mass death that's that's washing over the country that people were alleging it to be. Right. You talk about the kind of original glorious vision of the constitutional order of America, that as I get older and I approach middle age, I'm not sure if it's philosophically it's what's driving me or if it's just neurologically, I find myself increasingly cherishing the constitution mm -hmm. more and more each day. It's a very basic cliche thing to happen as I approach middle age, but I can't help it, right? I worry about the administrative state, but I also worry about the cult of the presidency. I worry mm -hmm. about sure. this thing that was supposed to be a chief magistrate has now evolved into something that's much more than that. People, this is like the sun god Ra who makes it rain, or this is the person who's your salvation. That the kind of all the mythic spiritual aspects they attach to it. Obviously, that's a bipartisan phenomenon. I think it'd be very hard to argue that the Trump presidency didn't continue to fuel that, continue to fuel the idea that the president is the kind of blazing hot center of American political life, which is in direct contrast to how how our government was intended to work. Okay, sure. But this again has very deep roots. I think you can trace this back to FDR, which you know then accelerates greatly with all the new powers given to the president in the Cold War that a president didn't have before. There's no nuclear arsenal before this. There's no CIA until 1947. Uh, and this idea that, well, we have this existential enemy at our doorstep, and so we have to be vigilant, which just requires, you know, extraordinary powers invested in this one man, and, and it just greatly elevated the, both the powers of the office and its impact on public life, um, as you say, that, you know, that energy that it kind of consumed. But even then, even then, you know, things were a lot, you know, Harry Truman famously used to walk from the White House to his bank to deposit his check, whatever it was, once a week yeah. or twice a week. Uh, in, inconceivable now. I mean, presidents roll out with these giant motorcades surrounded by armored vehicles and you name it. Uh, yeah, the fact of what I love is that Japanese internment was initiated by an executive order. People tend not to know that. That was from the, yeah. the great god FDR. It's funny what happens when people are desperate for a savior in the White House. I, I wonder, though, what you make of this for the cult of the presidency analysis, though. Trump, at least in terms of the theatrics, was very much like a highly concentrated version of it. But in terms of the use of the formal powers of the presidency, he was odd, he was kind of on the lower end in terms of his aggressiveness. He was actually oddly passive. I mean, well, even guy like John Yoo has made this argument yeah. that they he kind of like accidentally kind of re-restored certain constitutional cons restraints despite the fact he was the person that was dominating the, the news The central cycle. paradox of the cult of the presidency in modern terms is that the president isn't actually that powerful anymore. What do you mean? Meaning that the administrative state can can do, can ignore him, can block him, can slow roll him. Um, now sometimes, uh, you know, the presidents just have to give. Here's an example. Um, um, we all know that Trump wanted to get out of Afghanistan from early on. He wanted to get out, and yet in his four years, he didn't get out. 
right? Why didn't he get out? Now, in part, that's because he was blocked and slow rolled and, and constantly second guessed by everybody in the administrative state or the deep state that did not want that war to come to an end, right? You know, Biden did demonstrate that, uh, this is my interpretation of what happened since not being in the room, I don't know. He did demonstrate that when you fully and finally give an order, like they're still not willing to just absolutely defy you. Like if it's completely clear, mm. you will do X, right? They'll do it. But then they also do it in the, in the, in the most, uh, I believe that what happened, or I think it's at least plausible that what happened is that they did it in the most uh, incompetent, haphazard way as, a, as a kind of out of spite. Huh. You know, oh, you're going to give that order? Okay, we'll implement it. We'll and we'll see leave how, like $20 billion. Let's see how this it. works out for you. <laughs> and, 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 and other layers of incompetence, such as, you know, the, uh, the typical state DOD infighting that made all, all of that worse. When um, the president was considering invoking the Insurrection Act during the riots of 2020, his own uh, civilian secretary of state and the chairman of the joint made, made it publicly clear that they opposed that order and would not implement it. Huh. Right. Now, it's one thing, it is one thing to you know, get an order from a pre your boss, the president. I mean, tr the traditional way that these things should happen is you're in a closed door meeting, the president and his advisors. I'm thinking about doing this, Mr. President, I think that's about, you give him your best advice. Well, I, I still think I may do it, Mr. President, I, I can't implement that order. If you give that order, I will resign. But it still stays with, in this room. And then maybe he does implement it and you do resign and you say publicly why, okay? That was, that was considered the sort of ordinary, honorable way of these things to go. To keep your office and go to the microphones and say that about the president is insubordination. I don't really know any other way to put it. Huh. Uh, and those people were all praised for that. They're not in any way. It's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, there were movies about it in seven days in May. I mean, it's the kind of thing that this were happening and the, the players were different. Uh, everyone would be talking about the possibility of, you know, the military coup or the military getting... Uh, you know, acting extra constitutionally and how dangerous this is for our democracy. Instead, they're praised for it. Now, even if you think that that was the right decision, not to use the military to invoke the Insurrection Act, I still insist that it's dangerous for the secretary or any general to go out there and say that. If they can't do it, if they can't implement it, if they think it's a bad order, that they morally, their conscience will not allow them to implement, then, the, then if the order is given, then you resign, period. Otherwise, you keep your advice private.